Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining this virtual event titled The Modern Legacy of the Atlantic Charter. My name is Justin Reich, and I'm the Executive Director of the International Churchill Society. Um, I'm going to invite my guests to unmute themselves, and we'll do a quick introduction and uh, begin, our, begin our discussion. So 80 years ago last month, Winston Churchill and Franklin Roosevelt met on board the USS Augusta in Placentia Bay, Newfoundland. There, they discussed the general war aims of the two countries and agreed upon eight common principles, which became known as the Atlantic Charter. These principles, ranging from limiting each other's territorial expansion to supporting global gov self-governance, were both bold and broad. Almost 80 years later, current US President Joe Biden and current UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson met in Cornwall, although not on a ship, and agreed upon a new Atlantic Charter. I've invited two guests from both sides of the pond to help me understand the legacy of the original charter and also ask them to help us see into the future and predict what impact this new charter will have. First, I'm pleased to be joined by Corey Shockey of the American Enterprise Institute here in DC. Thanks for your time, Corey. It's a pleasure. And our second guest is Alan Mendoza, who is the executive director of the Henry Jackson Society. Thank you, Alan. I hope the weather in London is, is, is great today. It's wonderful. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. So be, before we begin, I'd like to remind our, get, our guests and our uh, attendees of two things. This conversation is being recorded and will be available for future viewing on the Society's YouTube page. Also, we'd love you to be involved in the conversation. So please send in any questions you have using the Zoom Q&A function, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. So to begin, I'd like to start the discussion on the new Atlantic Charter and the motivations behind this agreement. 80 years ago, Churchill wanted to use this agreement to push the Americans into the Second World War, but that didn't happen for another four months. So if I can start with you, Corey, and, and let's start in the present day. This is the modern legacy of the Atlantic Charter. Uh, per her event title, I'd love to know um, what are your what do you think the motivations are of having this second new Atlantic Charter um, between the UK and the US? And if I dare ask you, who do you think comes out uh, better from from this new Atlantic Charter? Okay, so those are uh, great questions to start the conversation. I I think the um, the reason that we even still use the term the Atlantic Charter, the reason it has so much cachet is because it marks the moment where free countries begin meshing together their war efforts. As you rightly point out, Justin, that the American entry into the war is a ways in the future still. But because of the Atlantic Charter, you begin to have joint military planning between the US and Britain. You, uh, you know, the Churchill goes home claiming that the United States agreed that it was going to escort convoys. Uh, Roosevelt had an interest because he understood that if either Russia, if, if either the Soviet Union or Great Britain capitulated to Nazi Germany, there was no constellation of actors who could together succeed. And so what FDR was doing was moving the American political conversation as far forward as he thought he could while retaining political support. And what Churchill was doing was whatever it took to create the impression, true or false, that American help was on the way. And what I find most striking about the original Atlantic Charter was how much Winston Churchill actually conceded to Roosevelt in order to get the impression of a common war effort, in particular, self-determination and, and the end of trading preferences, both of which are hugely corrosive to Britain maintaining its empire after the war. Um, what I think I see with the contemporary Atlantic Charter is a lot less weighty strategic significance. 
Um, what it looks to me like the motivations of the parties were Boris Johnson wanted to make Britain look consequential on the world stage and like it had a global Britain foreign policy after Brexit, which I think it does, uh, but, but that's, that strikes me as what his motivation was and what President Biden's motivation was, was to signal that as he so arrogantly said at the NATO meeting, America's back, that we're cooperating with other, that we understand the value of democracy internationally, that the United States isn't going to give preferential beneficial treatment to authoritarian leaders like Erdogan in Turkey and Putin in Russia in the way that the Trump administration seemed to. So I actually think the contemporary Atlantic Charter was equally paced between what the two leaders needed. Um, but it's actually striking that they don't really agree to anything that's not, I mean, it read to me like a NATO communique. They even had in their commitment to nuclear deterrence in, in our defense policy, it literally read like a NATO communique, by which I mean to say it didn't really commit either party to things that were difficult negotiations and consequential compromises. Uh, thank you, Corey. And Alan, if I could ask you to, if you have any response and, and maybe share your point of view on um, who, who comes out of this new Atlantic Charter, you know, who, like, like Corey said, Churchill comes home from Newfoundland's, you know, kind of touting this and, and selling it, you know, rightfully so, I think. Um, did that happen in the UK with, with the new Atlantic Charter? Did someone come out better and more excited than the other? Well, I, I think Professor Corey has, you know, rightly pointed out the differences between the two uh, the two circumstances. I mean, in one sense, both are an attempt to create order out of chaos, uh, different kinds of chaos. And of course, the chaos of 1941 was much more significant and much, you know, more dangerous and much worse than the chaos of 2021. Um, and of course, the circumstance different. Churchill was essentially a desperate man in 1941, uh, you know, needed, uh, needed to sort of secure a deal with the US in various ways, Britain standing alone, of course, um, at that time against the might of the Nazi war machine. And he basically was willing to swallow the bitterest of pills, um, things that he would not have accepted under normal circumstances in order to get Roosevelt to, to you know, sign on to what he needed. He was willing to do that. I think it's worth noting, of course, that he walks back pretty quickly uh, from some of the uh, things that, that they say in August. By September, he's already saying, hang on, hang on, this self-determination thing doesn't apply to any existing, you know, sort of British territories. We're talking about, you know, countries taken over. So, even there, there was already a you know a, a sense that I've got what I needed the PR victory. Now I'm going to walk back what I what I need in that sense. Now, to look at today, of course, um, you know, slightly different circumstances in the sense of we're not, you know, we're not facing the same threat, but in a sense, a reboot was you know being looked for by all sides, I think, or both sides in this case, uh, to what had happened in the years before. I think obviously um, from the Biden perspective, President Biden's perspective. This was a clear another opportunity to say what he likes to say, which is this is the, you know, uh, we're back, we're, you know, sort of doing things differently to the previous four years. Here's a good example. We're working together with our allies, a good sense that way. Uh, for Boris Johnson, of course, it was similarly and, you know, the usual sort of thing that British prime ministers like to do, which is to show there is indeed a special relationship. Um, and look, the two of us are, are, are re, you know, kindling this uh, transatlantic flame that's been going for, you know, so many years already has been the, you know, sort of backdrop to what we've done. So you could see that both had a reason and rationale for for signing on and for couching the, uh, the, the, the sort of the terms um, in the way that they did as well. But yes, it does read somewhat like a NATO communique, and I suspect the the idea here is that it will parlay into other, um, you know, discussions being held with Europe and other allies and the US in, in that sort of sense. And clearly, there's a very different set of circumstances going ahead, and we don't have the same pressures of 41. So what uh, the two the two countries do with this um, is is entirely different again to to 41 and where it goes. So 
I think it's a PR, you know, sort of strategy right now. The question is, will it be more than a PR strategy? Does it actually herald? Um, will there be meat on the bones? We've, you know, there's a skeleton here. Are we going to put things on it now that actually going to work going forward? So I think the one thing that we're all looking for, and particularly in the light of what's happened in Afghanistan, is what is leadership uh, in the West going to look like? And realistically, that leadership is going to come from the US and the UK. So this is the opportunity for both sides to, to start sketching what that looks like. Um, so I, before we get into the specific points, which I would really love you two to, to pick apart and see if there actually are meat on the bones, I think your point about um, walking back those points um, initially in 41, but the genie was out of the bottle, wasn't it? Because I, I remember I spoke with Lord Boateng, who is now the uh, chair of the um, Churchill Archive Center at Cambridge, and he was telling me he grew up in what was then the Gold Coast, now Ghana, and he was saying that when uh, Ghana was fighting for its independence, it used the Atlantic Charter's self-determination uh, as an inspiration. So the genie was already out of the bottle, right? I mean, I mean, for for the British Empire. And Corey, looking at you know, of course, this this new charter was signed what four months ago, three months ago. Do you think that's the most enduring legacy of the original Atlantic Charter? Is that self-determination, and as you so pointedly said, the corrosive? Uh, influence it had on the British Empire? You know, that's a great question. And I'm tempted to say yes, except for the fact that I think American pressure for decolonization would have come with or without the Atlantic Charter. I think you can see it back to Woodrow Wilson's um, position at the Versailles negotiations. I think it was, it, it's so ingrained in American political culture, and it's the only real fundamental political culture difference between Britain and the United States. Even though the United States continues to hold Puerto Rico, um, you know, at the time of the Atlantic Charter, the Philippines were under American control. Um, uh, so American hypocrisy, uh, you know, continues to be a, an important part of American foreign policy, but, but the pressure on Britain from the United States for an end to colonial control, I think, had been coming for uh, 20 years, 25 years before, and I think manifests itself most strikingly actually under the Eisenhower administration where you see strong push it, you see the Suez, you know, the United States willing to bankrupt Britain over the Suez invasion. Um, I think it was always coming, but I do think, uh, now that I'm thinking my way through it, I'm sorry, this is a, a okay, long no worries. path, but thank you for getting me to think yeah. more seriously about an important subject. I guess, um, I think, the commitment to a common post-war vision, not just anti-colonialism, but Britain and the United States create the post-war order. And that's what the Atlantic Charter really means, I think. Yeah. A belief that the two of us were gonna be in a powerful enough position to set the rules of order Britain had a lot more experience, had thought a lot more carefully about the subjects than the United States had. And only in partnership, actually, as much as the British love to talk about being Athens to our Rome, the post-war world is actually a pretty good example of it, where Britain has the experience to think through what do we need a United Nations to look like? And what are the decision rules? Uh, how do we make the bargains that create the NATO alliance? Those were not things the United States was either experienced in or likely to have come to good solutions on its own. Um, I, I'd like to ask Alan, one of the points of the, of the new Atlantic Charter, speaking of NATO, um, the fifth point reads, quote, our NATO allies and partners will always be able to count on us even as they continue to strengthen their own national forces. So clearly, Alan, was this a direct rebuke 
of the previous American administration. But as you as you stated earlier, is just the, is this just PR, or do you think there will actually be some sort of reinvestment or, or re realignment of priorities within with the NATO community? So I'll, I will come to your question first. I do want to just. Yeah. Tap please, on to what Corey said a moment ago. I'm going to abuse this position mercilessly. I hate you <laughs> won't mute me. Um, so no, I, I think what's interesting is is indeed that uh, the genie was out the bottle when it came to the uh, self determination issue, um, and you know. We have to remember Churchill is a is a creature of another age in the 1940s. I mean, he starts his career in Victorian times. I mean, he is on the frontiers of empire. I mean, the idea that he was going to, as he himself said, I didn't become the king's first minister to liquidate the British Empire. That wasn't his intention. But you know, there's no doubt that independence movements of various kinds got a shot in the arm from the idea that self-determination was important. And once you say it, yes, you can say it doesn't apply to you. But people are going to take that as a as a, as a as sort of a a, a, um, a position to to argue for. And people like Gandhi certainly did, and uh, they were appalled when Churchill, of course, uh, walked back on it uh, very soon afterwards. And I think that sort of exacerbated further um, dissent in various parts of the of the empire. But yes, of course, the Americans would have would have wanted to push this regardless, and it was part of, if you like, the the great awkwardness of the Atlantic Charter, which is that basically, yes, they're signing it in a sense as equals, but they're also signing it with a loaded gun at Britain's head because Britain was on its knees and the America, the USA was not. And therefore we all know the power realities of what was going on. I think what nobody could predict in 1941 was quite how quickly British power would, would fade um, post-war and how the war absolutely exhausted uh, the British economy and uh, I suppose in a sense, British society. So there are those playthroughs that, you know, you just don't know how that would have worked in different sense and how that decolonization process would have worked had there been no war and all these questions come to the fore. But to move to the to the question you asked about uh, um, sort of looking at, uh, you know, defences and national arm and so on and so forth. That, and the first thing which is fascinating to note is that um, getting NATO countries to spend more on defence was one of the Trump administration's great achievements, yes. actually. Yes. Um, and, and it's often forgotten now, but actually that sort of very tough approach saying, look, we're not going to bankroll you guys forever and we're not going to defend you forever. Uh, start spending money actually worked because country after country announced they were going to increase their... Sp and this is something American presidents had been wanting for years. So let's give Trump some credit here. He, he got it work. He, unorthodox, maybe not the best way of doing it, but he got results in a way that others didn't. So I suppose the question is, now that we've got those um, commitments, hopefully they'll obviously be maintained, is this now an, an, an attempt, if you like, to, as you say, restructure relations and try and do more with the alliance in a different way? I mean, it's quite clear that uh, the Trump administration was, was less interested in NATO, in some cases, a bit hostile to, to the idea of doing things with allies. Let's, you know, be realistic about it. This administration is in a very different place. It suggests, at least, it wants to do things in concert with others, although I again come back to the uh, the nature of how the withdrawal in Afghanistan happened. That did not seem very multilateral from where we were sitting here, and there were lots of questions about you know, the, what allies wanted, how they wanted that withdrawal to happen, which were just, you know, ridden roughshod over by the administration. So I think, you know, your question about whether this is PR or not, I think the very first opportunity to, to, to show it was more than PR would have been in the Afghan withdrawal. And despite people like the British Prime Minister, you know, basically begging the president to even delay the withdrawal by a few days, he decided not happening, not listening to you at all. I'm doing what I want. That looks to be a lot like America first once again. Um, so, you know, the question is, what does it look like to sort of have this commitment actualized in practice? And that we're very much still in the infancy of and understanding what this now looks like. You could make the argument Afghanistan was a, you know, an end of mission debate. It was already coming to an end. We all knew that. Let's start afresh. Well, OK, if that's the case, it's left a sour taste in everyone's mouths. It's quite important that we state now what the commitment will be um, from a leadership perspective from the US and what others will do as well in that regard. And I think there's a desperate need now to codify that. So I think the jury is very much out on what this document means. And the opportunity is there in the next few months for President Biden, Prime Minister Johnson and others to come together and say, actually, we want this to be more than just uh, rhetoric. We want action. Corey, you've um, <clears throat> spent a lot of time and a vast experience in uh, defense here in the United States. Do you think, to Alan's point, um, relations are, are damaged right now due to um, the uh, very chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. Discussing specifically on that. 
Yeah. I think Alan's exactly right. Um, I, I can't improve on the answer that he gave. I think he's exactly right. The, um, the, actually, I can think of one tiny caveat I can add, which is um, the sweetness that he's giving. It, it's actually proof of the special relationship. He's giving the United States credit for increasing NATO's country's defense spending when the Cameron government put the 2% uh, threshold on the table and forced it through at the whale summit. Um, but, but he's right on all of those counts. And I actually think that the most important point is Alan's uh, observation, analysis, that the Biden administration had an opportunity to prove that it was willing to uh, walk the walk, that it's talking so boldly. And it actually very much damaged transatlantic trust. Because what I'm hearing from Europeans is maybe this is who, maybe the Trump administration is who the United States is, because we don't see differences in policy on China. We don't see any greater respect for allied attitudes. We don't see any more openness to trade. In fact, what we see is a mercantilist policy dressed up as foreign policy for the middle class. Um, and so just as global Britain has lots to prove that, that you know, it can in fact be a major power without leveraging Europe along the way, the United States has a lot to prove that, that we're any better in action uh, than we have been the last several years. Corey, if I can follow up on, um on those comments with question. Uh, so regarding one of the points of the new Atlantic Charter, it states that, quote, we remain united behind the principles of sovereignty, territorial integrity, and the peaceful resolution of disputes. I'm so glad you brought up China. You know, the first two countries that come to my mind with this point are Ukraine and then the sovereignty of Hong Kong. Do you, you seem pretty pessimistic that if some other conflict arises between any sort of territorial disputes, that the United States will not will will not act in an appropriate way? How do you think a few years down the line, we will definitely see more issues with Hong Kong and probably with Ukraine? Do you think these new principles are a testament to future US actions? It's a really good question. Um, and both Ukraine and Hong Kong are really hard cases. And I guess I have a couple of thoughts. The first is Britain and the United States should congratulate ourselves that our militaries are so dominant in the center of the conflict spectrum that our adversaries have been driven to its margins to gray zone warfare, to terrorism, to information warfare, to cyber, um, because thank goodness, they lack the confidence they could fight and win a major war against our militaries. And that's something to be husbanded. That's something to be constantly strengthened. We always want to be in the position of deterring aggression, not fighting it. And the Johnson government deserves a lot of credit for the increases in defense spending and the seriousness with which they undertook the integrated review. Um, uh, you know, the, the hard cases are always on the margin, right? And now uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and capture of Crimea, um, it would, that was a hard decision for Western governments to make, whether they were willing to risk war with Russia over a promising but profoundly corrupt neighbor state. And it looks to me like what Russia succeeded at was not just the capture of Ukraine, parts of Ukraine, but also the brightening the line between who's a NATO member and who's not a NATO member. Mm. And NATO allies have done an excellent job of making increasingly clear 
that an attack on a NATO member is going to engage our core security interests and we will defend it. Um, the United States is leaning a lot farther forward toward Taiwan in that regard. Um, and Britain is likely to be considered, even if the government doesn't say that, the incredibly courageous decisions in foreign policy the British government has made since China started preying on Hong Kong. Um, first of all, it set an admirable standard for the rest of us and is pushing American policy in the direction that, British, that Britain led on. Uh, but it's also likely to, I mean, if it's true of Hong Kong, it's truer of Taiwan. Um, and so we are now in a position with Taiwan, almost what we were in with Berlin during the Cold War, where something is extraordinarily difficult to defend and extraordinarily important to defend. Um, I, I am, however, really confident uh, that, you know, Taiwan's different from Ukraine in some important ways. And as Britain knows better than anybody else, the United States isn't a strategic power, we're a sentimental power. We want to defend the people we like and we believe deserve it. And Taiwan's so far above that threshold that I don't think China can, uh, if I were the Chinese defense minister, I wouldn't be confident either that I could succeed by force or that it was worth the risk of repudiation. But I'd love to know what Alan thinks yeah. about that. Do you, Alan, do you have a different please. evaluation, my friend? That's very interesting. Look, I, I admire your optimism here, Corey, I have to say. I mean, it's you know very optimistic. And, I think that the, the, the great danger is that we're, you know, it's you're sitting in Washington and you see things in a certain way. We're, and we're sitting obviously in London and see things in a slightly different way. Unfortunately, we don't see that sort of commitment um, to even sentimental allies um, that you've just sort of highlighted. And I'm rather minded um, of the sort of sense that, um, say, the Argentines had in, 90, in the early 1980s when the British withdrew and Margaret Thatcher withdrew the naval defences from the Falkland Islands, um, despite it, you know, maybe being a red rag to a bull to say, ah, removing, maybe you're not committed anymore to your allies. Now, it turned out we were, of course, committed to defending our territory in that regard, but you can't necessarily blame the Argentines having a go. They felt we were you know, we weren't there anymore. We we decided we we're moving out. We're not, we weren't interested in more economic problems, focused inwards, not interested in defending the territory. And of course they attacked, they got a bloody nose and it worked the other way. So I rather fear that what's happening right now with the Afghanistan example, and, you know, we talk about sentimental allies. I mean, this is, this is it's quite extraordinary. A war that the American people fought for 20 years, okay, you know, with blood and treasure expended on this purpose, being told this was an absolutely fundamental national security goal to defend Afghanistan and make sure this didn't happen. And yet within a few months, we've sort of come out and given it back to the guys who were in charge 20 years ago when 9-11 happened. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a message of a different kind, isn't it? To, we'll defend our sentiment, our know, allies. And, and, and plus, what happened to all those Afghans who helped the US? Many of them were abandoned in Afghanistan. It's sort of a, a message to allies to be careful of who you ally with in that sort of sense. So, so my great fear of what's happened in the last month in particular, two months in particular, is that there may be a great miscalculation that's made in somewhere like Beijing to go. Look what the Americans have done in Afghanistan. They're tired. They've talked, they don't want to fight wars anymore. They don't want these never ending wars. They're not going to step in if we take Taiwan. Now, it may well be you're right, Corey, the Americans will step in and do that. But because there's this air of uncertainty right now, that's when there are great dangers strategically, when people make mistakes, miscalculations. And that's why I think it's so important to come back to our topic tonight. It's so important that the Biden administration makes an unequivocal claim about what it intends to do. And the New Atlantic Charter at least gives a framework for that and suggests exactly what you've said, which is that actually these things are really important. We will maintain them. We are going to stop aggression against you know, other countries in that way. We're not going to allow the rules-based order to be overturned. 
But given the actions of the last couple of months, there's uncertainty. And we need to hear from the Biden administration what it does actually intend and what it values going forward and what the American people are ready to stand up for as well in the world. Because if that doesn't happen, my great fear is that a dictator here or there, an authoritarian regime here or there will try their luck and then we'll be in the realm of the unknown. If I can ask you both to predict, if possible, what do you think is the first great test of this charter that we will see? You know, it, it, it's a it's a bold charter. It, it discusses climate change, it discusses uh, gender equality, it discusses um, affirms the you know economic equality and interests. Can either of you, if you could pick or choose, what you anticipate being? I mean, I think we've talked about it a lot with with Taiwan and others, but are there any other challenges coming around the corner that will really put these principles to test soon? And Corey, Corey, please start if you if you if you if you'd like. Well, I did notice that um, that climate commitments dropped out of the Australia UK trade negotiations. Mm. Um, so the United States might not be the only country that's making big bold statements that uh, when a sticker price gets attached to them uh, gets more difficult. Um, I, I think Alan has already had it right. Afghanistan was the first big test. Uh, other tests that I think are coming, I think the German elections in 10 days time, 15 days time, uh, are gonna be hugely consequential uh, because if you get a German government that isn't committed to continuing participation in NATO's nuclear missions, that will open up the discussion about nuclear deterrence uh, and the role it plays in the alliance. And Vladimir Putin will be doing cartwheels if we have a long agonizing debate in the West about, are we really willing to surrender our societies before um, defending them by nuclear deterrence? Uh, that, that strikes me as one particularly problematic one. Um, my guess is that uh, unrepentant as my fellow Republicans may be, uh, that they're likely to retake the House of Representatives in 2018 and possibly even the Senate. Although I think uh, the the candidates likely to succeed in Republican primaries are unlikely to be successful in Senate, in statewide Senate races. But, but the House is definitely coming back Republican again. And that may, um, that may make the Biden administration a lot more productive if it actually has to make compromises with Republicans. But I haven't seen much evidence of that so far. So you could see a United States that remains solipsistic um, and not attentive to changes going on in the world. I think that's a big second potential test. Thank you, Alan. I think I, I, know, look, I agree with what Corey said there. Those are those are two great tests that you're going to see coming up. Obviously, we've got the COP26 summit um, appearing uh, just around the corner, which you know we're hosting here uh, in the UK. That's clearly going to be um, a set piece for both the US and the UK and others uh, to, to address these issues. And of course, we'll therefore uh, go to the climate friendly parts of the of, of the charter. And of course, the question is, you know, are we actually going to come out with something that's going to stick and is going to make climate change a major uh, factor in our uh, in our politics going forwards and in and in our economic lives as well. And the crucial other question to that, which ties in, if you like, to the whole systems of open societies is, are we going to start holding China to account, the world's greatest polluter, um, and start making them bear the cost for their pollution? There's a big question for the world at COP26. It's all very well for us to start making sacrifices left, right and centre. But if the odds are, you know, not, you know, if, if things aren't evened out, 
uh, in that respect, and the world's great polluters are not playing their part in this, then the whole commitment to climate change is going to be false and facile because we're going to go, we're doing our bit, but they're not, and there's going to be a divide, and we'll carry all the costs and they'll get all the benefits. And that's clearly not what the charter is about either. It's about strengthening the democratic world uh, in this point of view. So I think actually the COP26 summit does, um, although it's, you know, it's going to be a climate change summit, there's always going to be a question of how the free world and the unfree world meet and actually deal with this issue. And we could get it badly wrong. And if we don't hold them to account for what they're doing, we would get it wrong. And it would also undermine what this charter is trying to do, which is to strengthen the free and democratic world, which, let's be honest, has been under a lot of stress and strain in the last few years. If we're serious about putting it back together again, uh, and we make, we want to talk about the environment, we have to address this issue as well. And I think that's going to be, to add to Corey's uh, too, uh, th this is going to be the other big challenge, I think, in the coming few months. Doug on it, I wish I'd thought of that. You know, hearing because you because we have it all the time on the news here. That's the thing. I think yes, it might. We, you know, it's a big, big policy uh, sort of uh, set piece here. So hearing you both discuss the um, the I don't want to say pitfalls, but really the the almost existential excuse me existential challenges of open democracies, open societies in pledging to address these eight principles uh, moving forward. Uh, to Alan's point, I, I think you're right. I think authoritarian regimes are, are somewhat um, uh, sitting pretty slightly and seeing us attempting to court, work with each other. But then, like Corey said, oh, UK, Australia, let's drop climate change because guess what? It's, it's going to cost a lot of money. So um, it's interesting. I, I really appreciated that remark. We've had some incredible questions. I'd love to get into them. Um, Corey, I'd like to start with you. You brought up Germany. And there's someone here named Rachel Cunningham who asked this question. It's slightly long, so bear with me. She says, Germany Green Party leader Annalena Baerbock stated recently that she is looking for meaningful cross-Atlantic relationships to address global warming uh, and global security issues. Her question is, is modern Germany about to preempt the traditional special relationship between the US and UK? Um, I'm a huge fan of Rachel Cunningham, so I'm delighted she's <laughs> participating in this conversation. I do not, I know I don't think Germany is about to supplant the special relationship for a couple of reasons. First, um, I actually think Germany's in a really interesting place where they have a choice to make, whether they want to continue to be virtuous, sanctimonious, and uninvolved in solving problems or whether they actually want to deal with the messy, unsatisfying, real world work of getting stuff done. And it's on that latter part that Britain and the United States do some of our deepest cooperation, right? Like we're, you and we are together thinking about where are we gonna station Britain's um, nuclear submarine-based nuclear deterrent if, God forbid, uh, the United Kingdom doesn't remain united? Um, and, and how are we going to deal with um, enforcing on China the rules of international maritime safety and freedom of navigation? Germany is in part because of the experience NATO had in Afghanistan, edging up to those questions, but most German politicians are still really comfortable in the sanctimonious condescension of the purity of not being part of the solution to the problem. Um, and I think that's a big impediment to deepening the special relationship. A second impediment, so, so for example, the Germans talk about climate change, but by ending nuclear power, they dramatically ramped up their use of coal. And it's great that this came out in that German um, chancellor candidates debate the other night, but, but there's still not the drive towards accountability on foreign and defense policy issues in Germany that you see fought red and tooth and claw in British and American democracies. Um, so I think that's one big thing. The other big thing is that um, the, if you have 
uh, the Greens and the FDP or uh, the left come into power in Germany, those are cadres of people that are a lot less well known in the policy communities. The depth of the linkage in the Anglo-American relationship, I'll just give you an example of it. Um, when I was uh, literally the junior person in Colin Powell's joint staff from 1990 to 1994, the British embassy in Washington was smart enough to understand that even though I was a weird anomaly in a military staff and had a totally unimportant job, that, that I was um, able to navigate the machinery. And if I could be persuaded of British interests, I could help shape American policy on issues of importance to Britain. Britain's also great at um, keeping connections with Americans when you're not in government, because that way we make time for you when you are in government. And I think that those kinds of political uh, norms and practices are a lot harder to pick up, especially with new people if they're coming into, new cadres of people if they're coming into government for the first time. Alan, we have a great question from Maury Kleinbart. It's long, so I'm gonna put it succinctly. And I'm asking you because you made a very strong uh, point regarding this. He says, in light of the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, how can it be remotely suggested that anyone, much less Britain, um, will trust the United States going forward? And how can it be seriously maintained that the United States is working together with its allies you know, after everything that happened last month? That's well, a good question, um, and I think you know you 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 look at this from the perspective of trust. I mean, look, you know, this is one mission. This is one um, example of working together or not in this case, perhaps. Uh, but the the relationship, as, as Corey's just put out, is is institutionalized essentially. There are so many points of contact on a daily basis where institutionally things happen when people are working together, and as such, it doesn't necessarily matter what happens in one particular sphere because the institutional connections go on it by the way that's why also even when there have been british prime ministers american presidents who don't get on and you know who obviously don't get on um that hasn't ultimately harmed the operational effectiveness of the special relationship and you've got the intelligence relationship for one thing that rumbles on regardless of who or what's in power it just moves on and the you know the information is shared and so on military terms we do things in different places we work together um, and that is always going to be the case yes it's left a sour taste in people's mouths people are upset over here there's no doubt about it they've been very upset at how they've been treated i mean i think it was in a sense surprising the prime minister you know actually went out on a limb and you know made a plea that he must have known wasn't going to be accepted um so i think it was an attempt to show look we're going to lead you know the rest of the world in this debate and try and shame you at least into into doing something it didn't work but we still tried in that sort of sense i suppose the focus now is right that's happened you know the president made his mind up he was going to come out let's look to the next thing that we're working together on let's have a look at you know where we're going to be sitting for example on the iran talks which are ongoing you know we never seem to end of course these iran talks constantly you know kind of kicking the can down the road but this is something clearly where the uk and the us will be you know working together on trying to come up with a unified position um for you know for our side of the debate if you like um and you know things just move on so Yes, it's it's an unfortunate incident, um, uh, Afghanistan, and it has left a sour taste, but everyone knows you've got to move on, because what's the alternative? Say we don't trust you anymore, we're not going to work with you, Well, what position does that leave you in? Because realistically, we don't, as we discovered with Afghanistan, the idea was, oh, well, we should go in and secure the airport then. Well, everyone knew that wasn't going to happen because we didn't have the kit to do it. So unless other countries are willing to, you know, kind of develop the capabilities the Americans have, we have no choice but to trust the Americans, even if they prove untrustworthy. So it's going to be constantly a question of, look, let's see the world together. We know that fundamentally, we do see the world alike, we see the broad parameters, we see the brushstrokes, we see what the Atlantic Charter is saying. Um, let's look at the next issue, put this to one side, and now get back into lockstep. And that's obviously going to be the aim going forwards. 
Uh, whether that, you know, is a view that's going to be shared universally, the German case is fascinating, as Corey's just sort of mentioned, uh, this could cause all sorts of you know, kind of chaos within NATO, for example, if, if that nuclear question becomes, uh, you know, becomes a live one. Um, so in a sense, that's going to play much more to the UK, you know, being the US's continued, you know, and trusted ally and vice versa, because the alternatives just don't look so good. And that's as much true for the Americans as it is for the Brits. Can I pile on on that point? Because I think that's absolutely right. Like this isn't the first time the United States has proved unreliable. Um, you know, how many years did Britain try and pull the United States into World War II before we actually came? As Lord Robertson of Port Ellen always reminds Americans, like Britain fought on its own a long time when they were waiting for us to come. And Suet, like there are, there are tons of disappointments, but Alan's exactly right. Neither we nor you have a better option. Um, and either or both of us might take it if we had it, but we don't have it and I don't see it anywhere on the horizon. It reminds me of what's the, that Churchill quote um, about allies. And <laughs> right. the only worst thing about having an ally is not having one. Um, and so I, I'm sure that he said that um, I should know this history. I'm sure he said that in, in response to some sort of frustration he was having with, with FDR in the United States. Um, all right, so uh, wonderful conversation. Just one or two more questions. I know we're running out of time. Um, I'm going to ask again, goodness, Rachel Cunningham is asking some really wonderful questions, but I'd like to ask you, Corey, She's again. a sharpshooter, man. Goodness. Who so is she Rachel Cunningham? <laughs> to, uh, uh, she must have worked with Corey in some way. <laughs> Google uh, stalker. No, we know each other across Twitter. Google stalker. She's super smart. Okay. For those on the, for those on the call, Rachel Callahan, thank you very much for being the VIP of the questions. Um, the question is, does the grand vision for global relationships of the new Atlantic charter preclude the use of conventional military force since the significance of us and UK enemies are choosing not to field conventional uh, military forces in these somewhat proxy proxy conflicts? So, um, as Rachel knows, and everybody else probably does too, um, the, the political science is quite clear about the difference between authoritarian and democratic societies on the issue of commitments. In free societies, it is just much harder and messier to get an initial commitment because you have to win the political argument with your public. But free societies are much more enduring in commitments once obligated, as I believe Afghanistan across 20 years bears out, right? Like we agreed we were going to do this together and it was really hard for anyone to wrench out of that path and there's enormous bitterness for having done so. Um, and, and so, um, we are just now groping our way as, as a community of free societies to understand what to do about gray zone conflict. Because what our adversaries are super shrewdly doing is trying to calibrate just below the level at which it would be a major alliance issue. You know, in the Eisenhower administration, they called these salami tactics. So thin a slice, you don't actually react to it, but it adds up. And, and we're in the messy middle of the stream to figuring out how to do this, but there's a lot of interesting work going on. Um, and as is typically the case, the countries with the slimmest margin of error, the Baltic states, for example, um, are coming up with some of the most interesting solutions. I would also commend the work to you of my AEI colleague, Elizabeth Bra. Uh, she built the modern deterrence program at RUSI in London before we stole her away um, to Washington. Again, the special relationship, um, <laughs> stealing each other's talent. Um, and she's working with the Czech Ministry of Defense to put some of these ideas about how to shield ourselves, to use the tools of free societies to protect free societies, to use transparency, the rule of law, um, shaming our businesses, uh, all of those things that we know how to do in a domestic context, 
to bring them into an international context. Because Rachel's right, we have to not only be good at the, at the center of the conflict spectrum, we also need to shield our societies across the conflict spectrum. Alan, if I can ask this final question to you, um, Stephen Shore, he asked that 41 Charter was essentially an alliance short of war against one key adversary. Is there an implicit adversary in mind in this, in this year's charter? And what, who do you think that is, if there is one? Well, the, I mean, look, there are two obvious examples. One, you know, long-term major strategic threat and one, you know, constant irritant. The constant irritant is Russia. We know um, it doesn't possess the power to be a long-term problem in the way that the long-term problem of China is. We know what's coming. The contours are clearly set. Everyone understands, you know, where we are facing. And everyone also understands that in the Chinese case, it's a real challenge to, if you like, the whole system of the free world, because the Chinese have the economic power in a way that the, the Soviet Union never did, and the way the Russians obviously don't today, to have a, a, a global system of their own, uh, which actually functions and operates. So there is a, there's very much a, people don't, haven't, people have pretended actually, they've, they've gone away and looked at the economics and gone, oh no, China's not a threat. But if you look at it from the point of view of values, China's a massive threat values wise, because the Chinese regime in Beijing uh, is, you know, uh, doesn't believe in any of our values of, of free societies and, and of, uh, of how we operate uh, in the West. So, of course, it's, a, it's designed to restate, if you like, the value of those things. And actually links very nicely to what Corey said earlier about, you know, um, our societies may be slow to get to the point of you know engagement with it with the problem but once we do we're quite resolute about it because we have them the power of having popular support behind it whereas of course authoritarian regimes do not in quite the same way so this is i think you know we're in an information war we're in a, a values war it's already started uh, we've been slow to get going on that we spent the last decade largely sleeping while the chinese have seized the advantage on that but i think everyone now recognizes uh, or anyone with any sense recognizes we're in this conflict and that's very much what we've been trying to do um reshape refocus uh, restate the values that makes the free and democratic world has made it the most successful um sort of experiment in global history and which we of course intend to continue going forwards but it's under assault it's under threat and that's why i think we have to you know very much uh, restate our commitment to those values but then crucially, uh, get ready to put action behind those words as well, because you can guarantee the Chinese are very much putting action behind what they believe in, how they are operating. And so, you know, the, the, the landscape's been set for the next, you know, sort of half century, maybe longer in that way. And so really, it's a question of how we together and others, other democratic allies decide to, to engage in this discussion, obviously not, not wanting any kind of hot war in this regard, we're gonna be, but there is a challenge, we have to meet that challenge and we have to be resolute about meeting that challenge as well. And there's no better time than now to get the show on the road. Very I good. think that's Corey, exactly yeah. right. I, just to sharpen the point, I would say the enemy outlined in the Atlantic Charter is George Osborne when he argued that wow. there's a golden age of China-British relations and the commerce we may lose in Europe, we're gonna pick up in China. And I think the current chancellor of the Exchequer made a similar set of comments fairly recently about our need for openness to Chinese commerce. And what we are seeing is the national security establishment is alarmed average people begin to understand the threat to values that Alan um, so eloquently just outlined. And our challenge is to pull our business and tech communities into alignment with the national interests. Uh, so if I, and I know we just have one, more, one or two more minutes. Tech, I, I'm, I, you know, I, I'm upset with myself. I didn't ask you both about this, but they seem like, if not one of the most important, the, the most important, at least in terms of industry, who can who can help align those values and lead from from those values. But they are almost hegemonic. They they have no, you know, they're all their customers are, you know, there are no borders with their customers. So is it possible for open societies to have alliances with the tech companies that were founded in those societies? to stand up for the values that open societies, you know, promote? So I would put it differently. Um, 
they are American companies and British companies. They are subject to law and regulation. And, you know, uh, they, that when the country faces national security threats, it is right and proper for the government to subordinate those business interests to the broader common good. And I think that's what we are beginning to see happen. Um, either tech companies are going to find a way to, um, to navigate this, or we're gonna legally and regulatorily force them to, because it's just not good enough for Facebook and Apple to say, we have to follow Chinese law in China, even if it means we are committing human rights depredations. Alan, final word. And I'll agree with that, absolutely. And it's, 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 it's also the case, if you look at how these companies are operating, um, their platforms are being used by our strategic enemies to spread disinformation, to spread fake news. And we, of course, cannot use the counter platforms in other countries in that same way. So there's clearly a security issue here. There's clearly a disinformation issue here. And there's also an issue of how is it possible, for example, to have um, uh, companies that ban the president of the United States from using their platforms? And I'm not making a judgment about you know, his behavior, which I think was disgraceful post the election, um, but how is he banned from certain platforms when the Taliban spokesman has 400,000 followers on Twitter and is allowed to broadcast their lies and their nonsense around the world? How is that a sensible policy in any way, shape or form? I think once you start down the process of banning political figures, you have to think very carefully if you're an American or British company about where you end up with this sort of thing. And clearly, there is a prime example where Corey's right. If the companies aren't prepared to take a sensible stance on this, we're going to have to take one for them and stop enemy propaganda from coming through. Corey from the American Enterprise Institute and Alan from the Henry Jackson Society, I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you for a wonderful conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Until next time, thank you everyone for attending. Take care.